As I mentioned, we're still in John chapter 13, and our text for today is from verse 12 through to verse 17. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. As we saw last Sunday, the sacrificial act of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, as radical as it was, was merely a very practical and memorable sign which pointed to Jesus' death on the cross, which was now less than 24 hours away. When he asked the question in verse 12, do you understand what I've done to you? A solid theological answer would be something like this. Yes, Lord, you have shown that salvation requires us to be cleansed by your atoning blood, just as you have cleansed our dirty feet with water. Now, that's a good answer. Remembering Jesus' words to Peter in verse 8, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Biblical theology is important because we need to know not only what we believe, but why we believe it. And in order to understand and to defend our faith, we need to ground our faith in not only the person and work of Jesus Christ, but also in the Bible, which explains our faith. The Bible teacher Stephen Lawson wrote on Twitter this week, Christianity without doctrine is like maths without numbers and music without notes. Actually, he didn't write that. He's an American, so he said math. But I've taken the liberty of correcting him. (laughs) However, Jesus' words to his disciples in verse 15 is not only theological, but it's a deeply practical answer too. When he says, I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. The washing of his disciples' feet was intended by Jesus to be an example of servanthood to not only his disciples, but for all Christians of all ages. And as we well know, and as we will be reminded this morning, true Christian servanthood flies directly in the face of the selfish nature of the human heart. Even for those who were saved and have had their lives transformed by the grace of God, putting others and their needs before our own is hard. It's one thing to have faith and some understanding of Christian doctrine. Those things are important. But putting our faith into action is a challenge. So the purpose behind Jesus washing the feet of his disciples was twofold. Firstly, it pointed to the cross, which was our focus last Sunday. And it was also a model for sacrificial love and service that we are to continue in his name. And that's our focus this morning. Servanthood is all about the attitude of the heart. If we don't have a heart for serving, we will only serve because we feel it's something that we have to do, rather than something we do out of gratitude and out of a response to God with our our grateful hearts for him saving us. Jesus acknowledged that his disciples called him teacher, so then he goes on exactly to do that. He teaches them the attitude of servanthood. In verse 1 of chapter 13, John writes that Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. A Christ-like attitude is sensitive to the hour in which we live. In other words, Christians should be aware of the spiritual needs of the people that we minister to. In times of doubt, we should minister faith. In times of division, we are to pursue peace and unity. When those we are with are hurting for whatever reason, that's an opportunity to bring godly comfort. So the, the context, remember, of John 13 was the impending death of Jesus on the cross. Now, of course, Jesus knew that in a matter of hours, he would be betrayed, he would be arrested, he would be tried and put to death on the cross. So he was fully aware of the necessity of the cross as the only means of our salvation. And going back to verse 8 again, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. It is here where we are reminded that all of Jesus' teachings and all of his miracles were gospel-centered. And we need to follow his example. Christian work and Christian service should be undergirded and based on the gospel that saves. 
We don't know when Jesus will return to judge the earth. But what we do know is that we are living in an age where eternal destinies will be decided. So then we should guard against living for the things of the world rather than, rather than for the things of eternal value. And John tells us in verse 3 that Jesus knew he had come from God and was about to return to the Father. So as Christians, we should be living with one eye fixed on eternity. Knowing that this life is, is a brief pilgrimage on our way to our real home. Our attitude to life in this world should reflect the same urgency that Jesus had for the gospel. We are to love and to serve others and each other. But we should never forget that the people that we serve are also image bearers of God. And their greatest need is salvation. As C.S. Lewis once wrote, you have never met a mere mortal. Verse 1 also says that Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, loved them to the end. He didn't love the disciples on the basis of their worthiness, because they, like us, were unworthy of his love. So what does that teach us? It teaches us that we are to have an attitude of love, even for the unworthy and the unlovely. So I told you today would be a challenge. Again, Jesus is our example. He was heavily criticized by the Pharisees for socializing with the despised outcasts and the undesirables of society. And his answer to this criticism we find in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 12. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus was about to go to the cross, but his deepest concern was for his disciples. Not only demonstrated in the washing of their feet, but by his extended time of teaching and ministry, which we see all the way through to the end of John chapter 16. His focus, as the shadow of the cross loomed over him, was on those whom he loved and he served, primarily because he had already committed his own concerns into the hands of God. And we should seek to do the same. Now, of course, we will never perfectly follow the example of Jesus, but that does not excuse us from trying. His words in verses 14 and 15 were not a suggestion, they're a command. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then as he says in the following verse, this is what it means to have the mind of Christ. Verse 1 again, Jesus tells us that he loved his own who were in the world. This is something else of Jesus' character, which we should be striving for. We are called to love the whole world in Jesus' name, but we have a special calling to love one another in the family of God. Galatians 6 verse 10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Jesus' attitude to his own, to his church, was unique in the world. The church is a unique organization. There is nothing in the secular world which comes close to the church. Think of the differences between a community and a club, for instance. In a club, you, you associate with like-minded people, while a community is a place where some you don't really want to associate with also live. And in this sense, the church is a community and not a club. So our love for each other within the church is based on Christ's sacrificial love for us, not on how we feel about one another. There's an old saying that you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Well, we are family. And we are stuck with each other whether we, whether we like it or not. The, the church is a community of grace which loves and serves with a common purpose to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Because he is the head of the church. And that truth should have a profound influence on our attitude towards the church. As Christians we are called to love the church. We're called to love the church of Jesus Christ and the people in it. If we love the shepherd, we are to love his flock. 
The church is Christ's own body and bride. So in the words of Ephesians 4 verses 2 and 3, we should be with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So if we are not giving of ourselves to each other in sacrificial love within the body of Christ, we then are directly contributing to the inefficiency which we so often see in the various ministries of the church. Now, of course, things like dangerous doctrines which are brought into the church by wolves in, sheep clo in sheep's clothing, those kind of things need to be swiftly dealt with. The Bible is clear on that. Also, when it comes to disciplining or even removing those who are deliberately divisive and are willfully threatening the unity of the church, but too often we allow our personal preferences and our personal tastes to determine how involved or how uninvolved we will be in the life, the work, and the witness of the church. We are family, and we belong together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus' self-sacrificial love is both the example and the motivation that we have for serving and loving each other. He said in verse 15, Just as I have done to you, it is what he has done for us and done to us. That should stir our hearts to look beyond ourselves. Notice that Jesus not only loves us, but he demonstrates that love in practical ways. The ultimate act of his love, of course, was on the cross, where he gave his life for those who put their faith in him. So our love for others, both inside and outside of the church, should also be demonstrated in practical ways. And when we are sensitive to the needs of others, we soon learn that there are countless ways of obeying Jesus' command to do as he has done for us. Notice also in verse 15 that Jesus doesn't call his disciples to do what he has done for them, but as he has done for them. This means that walking around with a bowl of water and a towel, washing and drying the feet of others, doesn't mean that we've ticked that box and we can now move on. Jesus calls us to adopt and embrace a lifestyle of humble, sacrificial, and personal ministry to each other. And again, this contradicts our selfish and our sinful natures. But as the Holy Spirit empowers us, Christians are to live in a way that gladly stoops to perform even menial tasks that represent the love of Jesus to the world. In verse 15, we see just one instance of more than a hundred in the New Testament where believers are commanded to love or serve one another. One commentator calls this the one anothering instructions to the church. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. But throughout the New Testament, we see this pattern. We are called to love one another. And that command occurs at least 16 times. We're called to be devoted to one another, honor one another above ourselves, live in harmony with one another, build up one another, be like-minded towards one another, accept one another, admonish one another, greet one another, care for one another, serve one another, bear one another's burdens, Forgive one another. Be patient with one another. Speak the truth in love to one another. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Submit to one another. Look to the interests of one another. Bear with one another. Teach one another. Comfort one another. Encourage one another. Exhort one another. Stir up one another to love and good works. Show hospitality to one another. Employ the gifts that God has given us for the benefit of one another. Clothe ourselves with humility towards one another. Pray for one another. I could go on, but I hope we get the point. <laughs> if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. This is what we should see in the church, instead of a proud, critical spirit pointing out each other's failings or weaknesses. Instead of those kind of things, we should be doing the opposite. Not only because Jesus is our model, but because we're commanded to do so. Speaking of this radical teaching of Jesus in John 13, the Canadian author Bruce Milne wrote in one of his books, In a world desperately searching for the secret of community, this passage speaks most powerfully. It is those who have been humbled at the cross and come to Christ as helpless sinners seeking his cleansing, who are the raw material of the community of humble servants. The cross is both the way of salvation and the key to community. Now, 
we might well wonder how well the disciples learned the lesson that Jesus taught them in John 13. We find the answer in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, under their leadership, the early Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing to the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That last verse, verse 47 of chapter 2, is a key verse in the book of Acts. As the church loves and serves, the proclamation of the gospel and salvation of the lost takes center stage. There are many practical needs out there, but the spiritual needs of each other should be a, speci should be a special priority of the church. Jesus' washing of dirty feet was clearly connected to his atoning death on the cross. It was because of the shedding of his own blood that Jesus could say to his disciples in verse 10, You are clean. And as we saw last, saw last week, he was referring here not just to their feet, but to their souls. And the cleansing of souls remains the greatest need of people today. And this is why it is a mistake for the church to respond to Jesus' foot washing by neglecting its gospel mission in order to respond merely to social and material needs. Now that's not to say that we shouldn't be moved by social ills like poverty and suffering and or injustice. But the ministries of the church in dealing with these needs must flow out from rather than replace the ministry of the gospel for salvation of souls. Jesus says in verse 17, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The world teaches the exact opposite. Because surely it's by looking after number one that we find fulfillment and happiness. But as usual, the Christian life is very different. So how are we blessed if we do these things, as Jesus says in verse 17? There are at least four things that we can take from Jesus' teaching in John 13 that he wants us to know if we want to live blessed lives. And we find this, these lessons in this remarkable chapter in the Gospel of John. And we'll look at them briefly. Firstly, we have to know that Jesus is Lord. The whole premise of Jesus' teaching is that his position as teacher and Lord means that we are to follow his example. Many Christians call Jesus Lord, but they don't follow his example and they don't obey his commands, which means then that they confuse their priorities with those of Jesus. When we try to do things for ourselves first, we cannot effectively love and serve others as we should. Secondly, we must remember that Jesus made himself a servant for us, and this should motivate us to do the same for others. This is the Lord of glory, yet in obedience to the Father's will, he humbled himself to die for us on the cross. This, this was the lesson of the foot washing, and Jesus continues to serve us even now as he intercedes for us in heaven. The third point to bear in mind is what Jesus teaches in verse 16. A servant is not greater than his master. Now, that sounds like stating the obvious. But Jesus' point here is that when we obey his command to follow his example, we should not consider ourselves to be above the servant roles that were not beneath Jesus. If he did them, so can we. And finally, because we are saved and because we have been served by Jesus, we are privileged to be sent to serve others in humility and love because of whom it is that we represent. The Bible teacher Joseph Ryan, he said there will be a quality of sentness about our lives. Being a missionary doesn't always mean that we go on mission trips. It may mean we are sent to the hospital to care for a friend who is lonely. We are sent next door with a pot of soup when someone is sick. We are sent to care for one another as the Lord has cared for us, as the Lord gave up his rights. And I love the way he puts this. We have been commissioned, initiated into the fraternity of the water basin, the order of the towel. Jesus said in verse 17 that if we know these things, we will be blessed. But he also said we will be blessed if we do them. Not only must we know, but we must also do 
knowing that we are called to be a blessing just as we have been blessed. Mere head knowledge is not enough. It needs to be backed up by commitment in our lives. Now, this does not mean that the works that we do are the basis of our acceptance by God. Rather, they are evidence of the true faith by which we are justified. Because trust and obedience are actually inseparable. We are declared righteous by faith in Christ alone. But those who have been justified demonstrate that faith by loving Christ and seeking to keep his commandments. Finally, Jesus begins verse 16 by saying, Truly, truly, I say to you. He is the truth, and he came to teach us the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is that the only way to truly be blessed and achieve real happiness in this life and into eternity is to be served by Christ himself in his death for our sins. And we then follow his example of humility, of servanthood, and all for his glory. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, again, that account of you washing the feet of your disciples astounds us. And it also humiliates us. Because truth be told, we find it very hard to serve as we know we've been called to serve. Lord, you know how much we struggle with our own selfish natures. We continue to be dogged by sin and temptation in our lives. But yet you have called us to a higher standard. And we pray, Lord, that you would remind us that it is your spirit who indwells us. And because of that, you have empowered us for Christian servanthood. Although it goes against our own natures, you are, you are the one who equips us for these things. And so, Lord, we thank you for your church. Thank you for our family. Thank you that we can be, love and be loved by and serve and be served by people within our church community. But it also goes beyond the walls of our church buildings. And so give us a heart of compassion for those who need, whether it just be a kind word, a meal, whatever it is, Lord. Each day we have opportunities to serve and to love. We pray that you'd make us sensitive to those things. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.